Uh, first of all, I want to introduce the genomics. What is it and why is it is important? The Tomato Genome Project and the current results. So, genome is a word that we use commonly, but this came from the 1920, and mixed together the words gene and chromosome. And then it's used also later, much later, in the 1986, to introduce this new uh, discipline that is the genomics, and now we are mm, <laughs> we are working with. And in fact, it, genomics tried to describe all the process that came from the cell to the chromosome, and then through the sequencing and the uh, identification of all the nucleotides componing the DNA to the uh, content of genes and then the production of proteins and complex. So the genomics could be worked in one direction and also in the other, where the information comes from the proteins. Um, in, for my approach, I work with the genomics has the sequence. So the sequencing of all the genomic content, so all the chromosome, and now with the next generation sequencing we are mixing all this information from the chromosome, try to sequence to build up the chromosome again, and then the identification of the genes and the gene structure along them has exon and intron regions. Uh, the genomics works with all other disciplines and for example starting from the sequencing and now with next generation sequencing epigenetics, the microarray analysis, the bioinformatics try to uh, use together all this information and try to make it simplest. Um, I start my PhD in the Tomato Genome Project and I was part of the um, annotation group and, what, and, and this project was really long, was five, five years, and we tried to um, use this, the sequence, so the genome, uh, both to phylogenetic analysis as well as um, collinearity, asyntonic uh, detection between species related to the tomato, and uh, to describe the structure inside uh, the genome in, or in terms of content of, for example, genes or repeats or information from expression. Um, all the data from the tomato genome project and the project from our other Solanacea species are in the Sol Genomic Network. They try to put together all the information, not only from the genome sequence, so the annotation, but also information from the genes, the phenotypes, the pathway, and the MAPS markers as the breeder tool. So they try to put together all the information to use them for all the biologists, not only bioinformatics or um, the, uh, genetists or specific to just one uh, field. And, and this is a, a platform for the Solanacea, but I know that there are many of them for several other plants and now we are building up a lot of genomes. Um, now I want to int introduce the annotation problem, that was my, my task, actually. So the problem for the annotation when we have the genome is <coughs> the, um, that the um, transcriptomic data that we want to use to annotate the genome are partial. So for the beginning we start with the EST data. Uh, actually we want to rebuild along the genomes the exon intron structure of an mRNA. But we have just the partial information from the EST, for example, now RNA-seq. So we want to use this information to rebuild the structure of the gene. And we are, there are several approaches. One of them is try to use this information to um, assemble and construct the, a tentative consensus that could be a potential mRNA and then align them along the genome. So for example, these are 
the ESTs that are aligned along the genome, trying to identify the exon intron structure along it. And using all this information, this should be just one gene, try to build up again the complete structure of a gene in order to predict a gene and annotate the new genome. Um, the um, the in in International Tomato Annotation Group works in, is an international group, so it works from all over the world. And we try to use several approach in order to produce a reliable annotation of the genome. We start from the back sequences at the beginning and then sequence from the old genome shotgun. And with several approach, mine was the annotation of ESTCDNA as I show you uh, along the genome. Then we try to um, use th this information to predict the genes. Then uh, when you predict a gene, a potential gene, then you want to know the function. So you need the, um, uh, the functional annotation with a database of protein. And then Interpro and um, in order to find domain inside, already known domain inside the gene, and other information to uh, produce a reliable annotation. And then share all this information with the genome browser. The genome browser is a platform, a tool, in order to, is a, is a web application and is a tool that is, um, you can download, for example, on your computer to share with other people. But it's used on many uh, websites of plants to share the genome information and all the feature inside it. It's universal. Um, uh, in order to uh, use the same approach with all the different genomes. And it um, helps you to uh, view the DNA, browsing, zooming, and scrolling. And now I show you how to see uh, the genome just piece by piece. And then you can also select and download information on your PC, for example, from an external genome browser. Uh, this is the genome browser here at the EMR, and I built up for the tomato and the data all from Jared. And um, you can have, in, in, the, in the first part, the birth height view, where you have just one chromosome and all the genes along it, so you can also check the density along the, the, the chromosome. You have several features on it that are showed at, with different colors. And then you can zoom for the details inside it. Uh, just from the beginning, you can, for example, search for a function, general function. You can know the region that you want to see, but you can just search for a function to know how many genes with that function there are in, in, in this genome. And then you can search. And for example, the answer are four regions. So we have four genes on three different chromosomes the third, the sixth, and 11. And these are the four genes with the annotation. So you can check the annotation, the regions, for example. And then you can select one of interest, for example. And you can zoom in. This is that gene on the genome. Uh, again, you have the overview of all the chromosomes, the overview of a part, the two regions flecking your selection. And this is the gene with the exon intron structure and the annotation below. Then you can select, for example, some features that you want to see below these genes. For example, in that case, we select information from RNA-seq. And we can see along this gene the amount of RNA-seq that was sequenced. And we can check for uh, just um, an overview of the expression of this gene, for example. And this is shown as sequence alignment. So you have, again, the exon and intron structure of each little piece. But you can also use other uh, approach for the same information. You can also have uh, a fluctuating um, graph for the expression. Now you have just little histograms that can help you to understand the, the height of each bar, means the 
deeply the, the density in a particular region. For example, here is, is really high because we have a lot of reeds. So that part is highly expressed. But Genome Browser is really useful because you can manage the view. For example, each of one, each of this graph is related to one of these two. So we want to put them together, close. We can just scroll and put it down near the relative information, for example, to have a better view of, the, uh, of this situation. <coughs> and otherwise, you can also uh, zoom here to see uh, a, a larger part along the genome, behind the genome, what happened behind. And this is our gene, this is our the re region, the genes near this gene. You, you can also see the expression, the relative expression behind. But you can also delete some of information like this, because you are not interested in this or this, and just to show a better view of your regions. Then you can select another gene, a region, for example, like this, and zoom in again to check another gene, to check other information. And, and for example, if you are interested in the um, details of this gene, you can just click on it. You have all the details of the annotation, for example, the regions, the global region of the genes, the exon infrastructure, because you, can, you need, for example, the information of all the exons. <laughs> or at the end, you have the, the FASTA file of the genome the gene region. Um, and then you can, as I told you, download information from a genome browser. For example, the FASTA file of that region, that could be this one or a bigger one of your interest. You can just download it. This is useful um, because it's um, a general use of a genome browser. And, and as I told you, for many species, for many plants, you can find the annotation of all the plants you are working with, um, show it in the genome browser. <coughs> so you can search your gene, you can search your region, you can download the data here, the FASTA file, but also the annotation of a region. If you want the structure or something more related to your work. Um, what is it now in the EMR genome browser? Um, I work with Jared and his data about the periclinal chimera of tomato. The periclinal chimera is a plant that has um, three, um, each tissue has three layers and the external one is just one cell layer um, belonging to um, one of the two species that are uh, producing this chimera. Um, in, in particular, we use uh, Solano Lycopersicum and Solano Pelenni, Pen, Penelli to uh, produce the periclinal chimera. The external layer of each tissue belongs to Penelli, and then two internal ones belong to Solano Lycopersicum. Uh, our approach is, uh, and, and this is the um, morphology of these plants, and you can see that this is the periclinal. And this is the difference in, in, in morphology of this plant. So it is really different. And we want to understand where, uh, which are the genes that are involved in this external layer, that is L1, that change the morphology of the plant. Um, we use a, an RNA-seq ap approach. There were sequence um, reads from Solanum lycopersicum and Solanum pennelli that are the, the parental and the periclinal chimera. We want to use these three data set to understand the function of the genes inside these layers and discriminate the genes related to each layer. And so for example, we have, oh sorry, we have a gene, the reeds belong to one species, the Heinz, that is Solanum lycopersicum, and one from Solanum pennelli. Um, so we map the three uh, data set along the genome, like this. So we have, as I show you, the gene, the 
Eins, so, um, the Eins reeds and the Penelli reeds. And then also the Pericana Camilla reeds. That's the, the, the starting data set. The second step is to use a, a snip calling approach to identify the snip that characterize one species, the two parental species. For example, in that position, we know that we have a T for Heinz and an A for Penelli. And the same situation here. So we want to use this information to characterize the two species, the gene between these two species. Then we want to use this information to characterize the, cam the periclinal chimera. How? We have mapped the, the reads so we can understand for each reads mapped along the gene if it's, for example, Heinz with the two SNPs has Heinz or Penelli because the two SNPs, for example, are, belongs to Penelli. So we want to use this approach to characterize the reads inside the periclinal chimera data set that belongs to one, spe to one parental or to the other. Um, and this is what is shown in the genome browser. So we can zoom inside a gene, a, a little region. We can also see the, uh, the nucleotides of each reads. And for example, here we can see a SNP and also here that characterize the two parental. And this is the data set for periclinal. And we can see the reads that belongs to Penelli and the reads that belongs to Heinz. Now, the next step is to use this information, so this characterization of the Penelli reads, to understand if that gene is Heinz or Penelli, uh, sorry, is, um, belongs to the L1, or this is the ex external layer, or L2, L3, that are the internal layer. How? As I told you, the uh, external layer is uh, genetically related to the Penelli. So, no, sorry, I don't have a mate. Um, to Penelli. So we, uh, we expect that that genes are more related to Penelli, so are more green. <laughs> and the internal one should be more related, genetically related to Heinz, so it should um, present more reads belongs to Heinz. Now I'll show you how. Um, this is the overview, for example, we have a gene, we have this different tissue that we use, and this is leaf, water stress, and fruit, and these are the SNPs that we use to identify the, uh, in the periclinal chimera reads, the ones belongs to Penelli or to Heinz. This is just an overview of the SNP that we showed has a little histograms, in order to describe, for example, this is a SNP, and we, we, we have shown the information of each the tissue has a little bar, and it's completely green when all the reads in that position belongs to that tissue, belongs to Penelli, and it's um, red when all the reads in, the, in that position belongs to Heinz. Um, as in that case, or is partially, so it's most green and, and uh, a little bit red for fruit, where we have uh, a bigger amount of reeds belong to Penelli than Heinz. This is another example, when, when we, we, we don't have any reeds, we have uh, just the, the black histogram. So, uh, how we use this SNP? If we don't have any SNP in that genes, we can't identify Nothing, at least. So the uh, periclinal chimera reads are not useful for identifying the, uh, the, the gene as L1 or L2. Or sometimes the SNP are, are not enough because we have just few inf information on a gene. But, uh, um, for example, in this case, we have a lot of genes and the most of them, we can just see from, just with color, belongs to Penelli, and so this gene is potentially L1, as this one is potentially L2, because all the reads inside the periclinal chimera data set belongs to the uh, Heinz species. Uh, how we um, evaluate this, um, uh, this, mm, this characterization? 
we use the re only the reads in the periclinal chimera has Penelli and Ainz that were affected by SNP. So we use the information from the reads from Ainz that are the wild type LW, the reads from Penelli that are PW because it's Penelli wild type. It uh, has two different data sets the ones in the periclinal chimera that belongs to Heinz and the ones that belongs to Penelli. The idea is that a gene should be preferentially L1, as in that case, when this is the amount of reads that you can see here. We have 40 reads belongs to um, Penelli in the periclinal chimera and seven, there are just few red here that belongs to Heinz. These two are the two wild data set. Using these four data set, we can understand if the expression in the wild type in Heinz is higher than the expression of the relative species in the chimera, if the, uh, the expression in the uh, wild type in Penelli is lower than the ones in the periclinal chimera, and if the difference between them is bigger in the is, is sorry is lower in the peri, in the Penelli than Ainz, and within the Pericana chimera reads, we want more reads from from Penelli than Ainz. In that case, we have uh, an L1 gene. As opposite, this is an L2 gene where we have a lot of of, of reads in the periclinal chimera that came from Ainz and just one from Penelli, so we have almost read the gene. And the, exp and the relative ex expression in the wild type is higher in Penelli than in Ainz. So this bar is not high, higher in the periclinal chimera just because we have an higher expression also in the wild type of Ainz. But at uh, the uh, wild type situation, we should have an higher expression in Penelli than Heinz, as I show it here. But inside the periclinal chimera, we have the opposite situation. So the genes should be L2, L3. Now, uh, so <laughs> these are the data from a previous analysis. Then I use new information available on the at the NCBI website from uh, libraries from Solanum Lycopersicum and Solanum Pennelli. There are several other works available of RNA seq from these two species. So we use all these new reads, there are a lot, to identify new SNPs along the genome in order to characterize more genes with our data. And moreover, we use also not only this tree tissue, but also information from flower tissue. We, so now we have four tissue for the planet chimera. We have water stress, leaf fruit, and also flower. And we identify, um, we, we identify 100 and half thousand SNPs respect this one from the previous analysis where we have more SNPs and in particular we have a lot of SNPs more than the previous analysis, around 80,000 more and we want to use them to identify new L1 genes. Uh, this is an example has the new SNPs can help to identify more genes. Um, so this is the previous situation where we have just four uh, SNPs, and this is our, the new one. In that case, in the previous situation we had, in the, in, in the previous an analysis we had four um, SNPs, so we can characterize just this new part of the gene. But with the new one, we can characterize also the central part. So we have more reads characterized. So we have a large number of reads to be compared uh, and this is just a global view of them, so you can see more reads in the periclinal chimera characterized by the new SNPs. Um, and also we want to use a new ap approach, a simplest approach, 
to identify an L1 gene. We want to use just the information came from the periclinal camera reads. So we want just to use the approach of the view. So if we have more green reads or less red reads. Um, so in that case, we have 35 uh, reads from periclinal camera in that tissue, in water stress tissue, and 31 from eyes. The um, uh, adjustment that we made uh, in the evaluation of this tissue, in, of this e expression, sorry, was that the L1, t uh, the L1 layer is really is just one cell layer, so we have uh, um, less information just from the beginning. So we have to reduce this bias, and the L1, G, uh, the L1 tissue inside each tissue is considered around the 20%. So we um, adjust the percentage, I'm sorry, adjust the percentage of our reads in order to better evaluate this comparison. And we, this is just the, um, the consideration, this, this is the new percentage considering the um, periclinal, the um, Penelli reads has the 20% and the uh, lycoparsicum read has the 80%. So we have to make this adjustment to have the new percentage that help us to identify the L1 gene. And in that case, we consider the um, we want enough inf information from LC and PC, and we want that this difference should be at least 60, so a higher percentage. This is the, the previous example, so using this approach, this gene is still L1, and this is still L2, as before. With this new approach, we found uh, 153 L1 genes that were detected, and uh, 98 more than the previous analysis. So these genes that we detect are different because it's a different approach. Uh, not only for the SNPs that help us to identify new genes, but um, also this new uh, characterization of the, this, this new using of the expression inside the gene. And um, using also the flower tissue, we find 55 L1 genes more than the previous analysis that are only detected by flower. So really specific in flower. And then we want to use a PCR approach in order to check these genes. And we found um, 111, 111 um, primers for these genes. And are less the, 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 we found less primers than the global amount of genes because we want primers, so this is the, the, the gene, we want primers without SNPs, and we want that the um, amplified regions between, between these primers uh, has at least two SNPs <coughs> in order to use this, this uh, data, as was already made before um, by Gerard. Uh, we want to amplify this gene, and for example, in this example, we have the genes amplified for Lycoparsicum penelli and periclinal in order to understand the, um, the nucleotide polymorphism in this region and it, it, it identify which polymorphism we have in the periclinal chimera. So we want to be really sure that in that amplified region we have enough SNP to identify this. Um, difference and in that case we have an L1 gene because the uh, po polymorphism is related to Penelli and in, in this other case is related to Lycoparsicum so we have an L2 genes. So to conclude um, we, we want to make available this data on the genome browser from the of this L1 analysis on a public genome browser and it will be uh, probably the SGN database and we are ready to share this information with them because they had um, the genome browser of all the information of tomato. Um, then this new approach with uh, this new two big data set 
of reads from Solanum Lycopersicum and Solanum Penelli help us to find a lot of new SNPs and uh, so also new L1 genes. Um, then we have now ready this list of primers in order to check these new L1 genes and then we are ready to a new analysis on the uh, Solanum Penelli genome because now here we use just one genome belongs to one of the two parental, just the Solanum Lycopersicum gene. Now we have also the Solanum Penelli <coughs> recently available and we are ready to perform a new analysis on it, a little bit different from uh, re respect this one, just to compare the information between the two mapping in order to find new L1 genes and also to confirm the information that we already produced. And then before, thank you from, for the attention, I will also to thank you for this year, because mm -hmm. I'm, <laughs> I'm sad to leave, but, and so I want really to thank you for all this year, because it was really, was really good for me. Uh, and then I thank you also for the attention. <laughs>